Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello and welcome. My name is Robert Milton. I'm the co-chair of the Memberland's Arts Forum from the Commonwealth Club. Thank you so much for joining us for a flashback to old time popular radio shows presented by Noah Griffin. For starters, I want to take you back to a little montage of old clips from those days. I am the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. More and more paper used in the manufacture of many vital war supplies must be shipped overseas. We must do a better job of paper salvage than we have ever done before. With so much paper going to our armed forces overseas, we must save for salvage every bit of every kind of waste paper that remains in this country. speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger. It is later than you think. Old time radio shows were loved and embraced by many. Noah Griffin will take us back to the most popular and favorite radio shows of their day, from live nightlife, from night live crime scenes to soap operas, detectives, mystery shows, family sitcoms, and westerns. The presentation will conclude with the Q&A, so have your questions ready. Before I introduce Noah, a little background about our presenter, so it's good to have some context. Noah Griffin's a native San Franciscan, a former television talk show host, and a former radio broadcast host for WJIB Radio in Boston, KFOG, and KTO in San Francisco. Noah's, radio, Noah's interest in um, popular radio shows started when he was six years old when he was given his first Hopalong Cassidy radio. We're so honored to have him today. Welcome, Noah. How are you? I'm wonderful, Robert, and thank you so much for having me on the program. It's just a great, great honor and privilege. Are you ready to take us back to that old world radio? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, my parents bought me a Hoppel on Cassidy radio with a cutout of uh, Hoppy on top of Topper. Uh, his, it was silver cut out on a red radio, and I remember it because the first radio programs I listened to were Big John and Sparky, which is uh, related to you on the earlier montage. And I thought Sparky was real, but he was actually a little elf that was the imagination of the show's creator. And uh, my parents took me to the Civic Auditorium when I was six years old to see Sparky. And I was so disappointed to find out he wasn't real because for me, he was real. Uh, Hopalong Cassie actually was real. I found out later on, you know, a lot of those shows, those adventure shows, as those Westerns were uh, interesting to kids. And so I, I would watch a lot of those and I listened to a lot of those and they switched on over to a television. William Boyd was the fellow who played Hopple on Casty. He was in his day a B actor and a drunk and a roué. And uh, he got the role to play Hopple on Cassidy. And he realized that children were going to be listening to his program. And so he cleaned up his entire act. He drank nothing but milk after that. He changed the <laughs> He changed Hoppy to uh, kind of a root and tootin sort of guy to a, a straight shooting Western fellow with the, the hat and all. And at the height of his career, he had 1,000 items that were uh, in his name, uh, Hopalong Cassidy uh, uh, 
toothpaste, Hopalong Cassidy, uh, uh, horse horses that you could uh, get, a uh, stick horses, uh, those uh, pop guns that uh, kids all remember back in the day that uh, uh, they're just, you know, you'd have holsters and you play cowboys mm -hmm. and Indians, which probably isn't appropriate to play today, but that's what we played back in the day. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And in fact, that old Hopalong Cassidy radio and my boy is 24, I was just a little kid. KSFO used to play those old time radio programs. And I turned on the hop along Cassidy radio and he could see the tubes warming up in the back. You know, they had all the tubes and uh, it just happened to turn on to KSFO playing the life of Riley, which we'll talk about a little bit later. For, so for years, he only thought old time radio programs came out of that old time radio. Every other radio in the house was appropriate for what you would normally the normal fare. Uh, but that was fascinating to me. And uh, I got more interested in it when I was on KGO radio, because huh. every uh, once a month we would do either old time radio or old time television shows. And some of the ones were just absolutely fascinating and a lot of fun. Uh, one of the ones that switched over from uh, from 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 radio to television was the uh, was was uh, the Lone Ranger show. with the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger. Now that was out of oh. WXYZ in uh, Detroit, and it began on November 27, 1933, uh, oh. and then it spread up to WGN in Chicago and the WOR New York, and those three stations formed the backbone of what was then called the Mutual Network in 1934 with a WR as the hub of the Lone Ranger, its biggest early evening attraction. With the Mutual Network, uh, the Lone Ranger was first heard throughout the Midwest. He was a tough, hard man with will of iron and a swerving sense of justice. He had few weaknesses and meted out law and order with the objectivities of computer, as was said. And even though he never smoked nor drank, uh, nor shot to kill the substance of the highest ideals of the American life. The Lone Ranger maintained his credibility to the end. The first voice of the Lone Ranger was played by Jack Deeds. And within a month of that, he was replaced by George Seaton. And by May of 1933, the unheralded staffer named Earl Gasser got the role. And he played it for more than eight years. Uh, the regional networks that we talked about were added in January of 1937. Uh, and it was added to the, the net, West Coast was added. Uh, Silver Cup Bread was the sponsor and continued to sponsor until early 1939 when Bond Bread became paying the, uh, came to pay the bills. General Foods became the sponsor in 1941. Uh, and then, uh, interestingly enough, but then it came on television from 1949 to 1957. The sad, sadly, sadly Gasser, who was the star of the show, would always talk about automobile safety. That was his key public service announcement. Well, he died in an automobile accident, uh, uh, oddly enough, strangely enough. And the announcer of the show, Brace Beamer, played the program from 1941 to 1955, of course, with his faithful then called Indian companion, Tonto, the during and resourceful masked rider of the plains, led the fight for law and order in the early Western United States. Of course, they say nowhere in the history, pages of history can one find a greater champion of justice, return to us now to the thrilling days of yesteryear, out from the past, the rolling thunder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Lone Ranger show on uh, television uh, obviously starred Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels, who also played one of the Osceola brothers in the movie Key Largo. So you can not only hear his beautiful baritone voice, but you can also uh, hear him. Oddly enough, once uh, a year, they would start with the first episode of The Lone Ranger. So you could find out how he became The Lone Ranger. I guess he was uh, in, in, a, in a cabin shoot off with some a canyon shoot off with some bad guys. Oh. And they killed five of his companions. He was the only one left. And so they thought that all were dead until his friend, his childhood friend happened to come upon them, who was Tonto. And he realized that one was still alive, nursed him back to life. And uh, they became uh, buddies for the rest of those uh, programs. Um, so once a year, they, they talked about how the Lone Ranger came about. So we always think of him when we think of WXYZ radio in, uh, in Chicago. Another bait uh, out of Detroit, rather. 
another great uh, person of the past was Jack Benny that we remember so well oh. from radio that switched over to, to television. Very few people made it from, from radio to uh, from vaudeville to radio to movies and to television. And Jack Benny was one. He was born Benny Kabelski in 1894. Uh, his father was a Jewish immigrant from Poland who became a backpacking peddler in Chicago, uh, owning a haberdashery store nearby in Waukegan, Illinois. And uh, Benny left during his sophomore year to team up with a pianist and continued his act as a, as a violinist. And for the first six years, he never cracked a joke. He just was a professional violinist and thought very well that he could continue that way. Until he was drawn into World War I, he enlisted into the Navy at the Great Lakes Naval Academy uh, Naval Training Station and was tapped to play a benefit for the Navy relief. And he bombed so badly, he just took the fiddle and put it under his arms and start to tell jokes. And people laughed at the jokes, remembered that, and continued on telling the jokes. Uh, but he had to change his name from Benny Kabelski to Jack Benny because there was another very famous vaudevillian at the time by the name of Ben Bernie. Uh, Jack Benny played the palace in New York. He went to the West Coast. Uh, we're there where he met his wife-to-be, Sadie Marks, and uh, at the act, actually at the May Company. Uh, and that was a joke that ran throughout the entire program. Uh, Ed Sullivan asked him to appear on CBS radio interview show in March of 1932. He became very popular, and then he sought to uh, have his own program on radio. And he left a $1,400 a week job in order to do that. So he was first premiered on the NBC Blue Network on May 2nd, 1932. He was a solid hit. Uh, and in 1933, the show was picked up by Chevrolet. Uh, Harry Cohn wrote most of the Jack Benny routines. Um, and Ted uh, the uh, Olson to Ted Williams uh, uh, and Frank uh, Don Bester was the band until uh, Harris, uh, Phil Harris took over. Uh, he and his wife uh, were part of the show and he would always say, hello, Jackson. And then Bob Crosby took the show over in the uh, 1950s and they had a very popular cast. Uh, Rochester was a Pullman Porter scheduled to be on one show, but they brought him back uh, and he continued on. He was a San Francisco stageman. There's a little local link there. And then Don Wilson was his announcer for many, many years. Uh, in early years, it was uh, produced by the, uh, the major uh, advertiser was Jello. Uh, but Don Wilson was a Denver guy starting off in the radio in his hometown and played the part of a singing trio in 1924. Later, the sportsman joined the program. Kenny Baker was the uh, main singer. And then, of course, replaced by Dennis Day, uh, and also who was discovered by Mary Livingston, who was uh, John, uh, Jack's wife on the program. The writers were Sam Perrin, Milt Josephberg, uh, and David Belcher. Uh, the show is divided into two segments, opening up in banter and then a dramatic spoof at the last half of the program. Uh, and he was very generous in letting other people get the laughs. Uh, Rochester got a lot that got the better of him. Uh, 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 and then he had a running uh, feud with uh, Fred Allen, who had a very popular show. Uh, they were such so well and so loved and so secure that Jack had many contests, uh, one of which, which uh, Fred Allen sponsored for the benefit of war bonds. And it was I Can't Stand Jack Benny, which drew 300,000 entries. Uh, which was pretty fascinating at the time. Of course, one of the major voices on the program was Mel Blank, uh, who was his violin teacher. And uh, uh, one of the funny stories was that Jack Benny was scheduled to play at the White House and he drove his car past the Sentry and the Sentry recognized who he was and was waved through. And Jack Benny said to his driver, back that car up. And he points to his violin case. He said, you know, I could have had a Tommy gun in there. The Sentry said, I was afraid you might have a violin in there, Mr. Benny. <laughs> uh, Sheldon Leonard, uh, of course, was one of the uh, regulars on the program who played the tout when Mr. Benny ever, when he went to the racetrack uh, and he would say, Psst, hey, buddy, come over here. Uh, so that was uh, very famous. He, the show continued on in television uh, until I think 1964. 
and he played a lot of benefits until 1974, uh, and he died that year, December 26, 1974, sadly, of cancer. Uh, one of the other funny shows on television was Art Linkletter's uh, uh, People Are Funny. That actually started on radio in 1942, uh, then uh, went on to television. Jack, Art Linkletter told me, I met, I met him one time, that he started off as an announcer at the 1939 fair on Treasure Island. Uh, and then uh, it began from there. I asked him a question once. He also had a show called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Uh, and that moved on to television. And he always started off with the kids on a panel. And what did your mother tell you not to say today? And one kid said, in the book I read, my mother said not to talk about Uncle Bill and the Coast Guard. He said, Uncle Bill and the Coast Guard. He said, she said, well, he must be in the Coast Guard because every time he comes over, he asks my mother, is the coast clear? And I said, did that actually happen? He said, yes, it did. <laughs> we went to a joke off. And the funny thing about the joke off was every joke, all the premise had to be told. And Jack uh, or, or uh, uh, Art Linkletter whispered in my ear the punchline. He was so well versed in jokes. Either he knew every joke or he could tell by the setup what the joke was going to be. Um, but his show uh, lasted a long time and then went on to television. And then the other show that people uh, remember is Groucho Marx's You Bet Your Life, which was a funny show that actually you could still find that. Uh, there's, a, there's a 24 hours a day on the internet. It's called Old Time Radio, 1710 Antioch. And they have shows by genre and by date. So at 3.30 a.m. in the morning, if you're ever up that early, they rotate three shows. One is the Quiz Kids. Another is the Whistler, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the uh, third show is uh, Groucho Marx's You Bet Your Life. And Groucho Marx is so sharp and so funny. He's in 2021 and everybody else is on the show back in 1952. He's just that quick. Uh, oh, wow. He would have maybe three uh, sets of guests and they were they were picked out uh, from the audience right before the show. So he didn't know who they were. So all of his ad libs are, ad -libs are very quick and spontaneous. And the other localizing of the program is George Finneman, his announcer, actually was a San Franciscan. He went through Poly High and he went to San Francisco State. I was oh. orig he was originally born in China and his, his, his parents came over to San Francisco. So when everybody, whenever anybody of Chinese origin was on the show, he says, hey, you're from China. Do you know Fenneman over here? Fenneman was born in China. So that was a running joke. And the other thing about the program is, you know, you, you say the magic word uh, and you, you won $100 and the, and the duck came down and presented the, uh, the, the $100 and nobody could ever remember the name of the duck. And I did all kinds of research. I couldn't find it either and only find out the duck never had a name. Uh, so at any rate, I think nobody left broke. You'd, you'd start off with $20 and you'd have to. Uh, uh, to you, each question that you asked in the category, you could uh, bet any multiple of that $20. And sometimes people actually came off with no money because they'd wasted, you know, they bet all their money and they lost. But he would always give a, a, a question like, who's buried in Grant's tomb? And so then they'd walk off with at least some money from the, from the program. And so that lasted on radio and it, uh, from 1948 to 53, then it went on television and lasted till 1961. Uh, and so that was just one of those wonderful, wonderful shows of yesteryear. And then of course we go to the Whistler, which we talked about earlier. Maybe we can play the beginning of that again. Uh -huh. yeah. Those are the 13 notes that was beginning of the Whistler, and it was brought to you by Signal Oil. As a kid, we were, I was born at 1119 Webster Street. Uh, it's our first home, it was a uh, fourplex. And uh, right down in the corner was a Signal gas station. So that show meant a lot to me later on. It was a little too scary and a little too late at night for me to be up, but it ran from 1942 to 1965. And uh, the memorable opening had 13 notes, which only one in 20 people could, uh, Whistler was very famous. And it, uh, the, the opening lines were, I am the Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. 
Yes, I know the names of terrors, which they dare not speak. The show is interesting to me because as I said, I, I grew up down the street from a signal gas station. An old timer, Sidney Amber, who at the time, a few years ago, was 109. He greeted the folks at Sears Fine Foods, where I took my boys. Uh, and he said that at the end of that block where I was born when he was a boy was a livery stable. So that was one of the, the, the memorable things that localizes uh, that program to me. Can we play uh, that now? Yeah, if you can, that'd be yeah, great. Yeah, let's, let's see that. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. The Whistler's strange story, Gratitude. <laughs> Wonderful program, wonderful program. Very scary if you're a young child. So a lot of these I went back to as, as an adult and I'd have those programs on Friday night, at least once a month on KGO. And we'd ask people, if they, and if people have questions now, they can tune in about various shows because I have the book in front of me. If I don't remember the show, I can certainly go on the, uh, go through the book and find it for you. Uh, there's a wonderful show uh, that uh, Ken Burns did called The Empire of the Air. And it was produced in 1992. And it talked about the men who started and began radio and what a revolutionary thing it was. I had an argument with a friend one time, whether what was more revolutionary, radio or television. And he won the bet with me. I took television, he took radio. He said, radio actually was the first medium that brought entertainment into the home. Mm. Television just stepped it up in terms of sight, sound, and motion. Uh -huh. And each, each level, thought, they thought that it was going to end the previous one because va vaudeville thought that radio would end vaudeville. And it really never did. And radio, television thought, the, the people in radio thought that television would end radio and it never did. Um, and I could, uh, the, the thing that I remember most about that program is at the end of the show, they had some little kid say, that uh, I think radio is better than television. And the answer asked why, I said, the pictures were better. And if you think about it, it was a theater of the mind. That was a very famous right. thought, saying about radio. Huh. If you go down to, if those who were old enough to remember Jack Benny's vault, uh, he would keep all, he, the thing about Benny, the two things he uh, stressed about himself on the program is one that he was very vain. And the other one is he was very cheap and he'd keep all his money in a vault. And you'd hear, him going down the stairs, the creaky stairs, and he'd get there and he had some old guard there that had lost track of time. And he said, are you still protecting me from the Redcoats, Mr. Benny? But in your mind, that, that vault was always as you pictured it. When you got on television, it was a little bit different because you had to see it the way the producers of the show saw it. So it really never took the place of what was in your mind at the time. And so there was nothing better as a kid than to, you know, turn the lights out and be underneath the covers and to listen to the radio shows that perhaps were a little bit older than your, your parents would allow you to listen to. And then at that time, there was, uh, when I was on radio, there was a society for the preservation and encouragement of radio, radio drama, variety, and comedy called Spurdvac. And I think you can still... Um, find them on the internet and send off for those old time radio shows that you like and you remember. And one of the big thrills for me was to do the last interview with Carlton E. Morse. He had a show entitled One Man's Family. It was the Barber family that uh, was living in Seacliff. And it was, and it was uh, a house where at the back of it, you can see the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh -huh. he referenced a lot of San Franciscana. So you could the streets people walked down it was and it lasted for 27 years on the air and it just one day it ended that was it he didn't wrap it up and it, it spawned a lot of earlier early stars uh, uh, that were on the program uh, mercedes mccambridge was one tony randall was another 
Uh, they started off as kids and they went through the whole uh, history of the, of the program. But that was one of the longest lasting programs on, uh, on radio. Bob Hope had a, a show. I was uh, pleased to meet him at one point here in San Francisco uh, in the mid 90s. Uh, I asked him uh, how he got started. He said, I started off as a boxer. Uh, bo boxing under the name of Packy East, and I never got to thank the, the guy that knocked me back into vaudeville. Uh, and uh, then he went on to uh, to star, obviously. And uh, I said, "Is it true that uh, Fatty Arbuckle picked you and Humphrey Bogart out as the two young, promising stars of the 1920s?" And he said, "Oh yeah, uh, Fatty Arbuckle. Uh, I worked with him 67 years ago in Cleveland." Uh, it was interesting when he when he got on stage he was at full height and did his full program and then we got off stage he was just a little old guy puttering around in tennis shoes uh so that was a fascinating uh, opportunity to meet somebody that was a hero and brought so much joy to to so many of uh, folks when he said he he boxed under the name of Packy East. It brought to mind one of his old jokes i said i thought you boxed under the name of rembrandt because you were always on the canvas and uh, he laughed and I was just pleased that after so many jokes that I had to, that I got the opportunity to laugh at for, uh -huh. from Bob Hope, I had a chance to make him laugh. So that was uh, wonderful. I'm sure your listeners have quite a lot of questions and I'd be happy to uh, go to any or you might have some of your own. About oh, I, I do. I have, I have so many questions actually. Okay. Though. Um, yeah. Um, so were the radio programs during that time, were they uh, pre-recorded? Were they live or pre-recorded? Uh, some of them were, were live and then some of them were actually uh, pre-recorded. They called transcribed uh -huh. uh, so they could be heard at a different time uh, on, on the West Coast. Gotcha. Uh, and, but they didn't have the opportunity many times to, to, to once you made a mistake, you just made a mistake and the show had right. to go yeah, over. To and they had an audience and a lot of these shows were broadcasted out of hotels and people wore uh, tuxedos and evening gowns to be in the program and people dressed up to actually go to the shows. So that wow. was, uh, it was a big deal. It was a big deal, yeah. Right, right. In terms of um, gender, um, who were the prominent listeners? Was it women or men? Well, I think <laughs> it depended a lot upon the shows. It's Stella's uh -huh. Dallas, which was a soap opera that appealed to a lot of the women. I think the mystery and the detective shows, I'm not trying to be sexist here, but I'm sure women uh -huh. listen to them. But a lot of the mystery and detective shows appeal to the, the men. And oddly enough, a lot of the mystery shows that obviously kids want to listen to what they, their parents tell them they can't listen to or they shouldn't right, listen to. Right, of course, of course. Appeal, <laughs> appeal to a lot of the kids. <laughs> and then the adventure <clears throat> shows that the Westerns, except for uh, Gunsmoke, uh, that was the first adult Western. And it was on the radio starring William Conrad initially. Uh, and uh, it was one of those shows where the good guy didn't always win. And uh, they, they, the production value was really uh, very high. Uh, and you could hear the wind whistling and you could hear the, uh, the boots and the spurs, et cetera. So it, it wasn't kind of as corny as maybe the Lone Ranger or uh, some of the, not the Lone Ranger was, was that corny, but uh, it, was, yeah. it, was, it, it was a show of its time. And Gunsmoke lasted a long time on the radio. And then it went to television. It was on uh -huh. both radio and television at the same time. And William Conrad, because of his wonderful voice, lasted for quite some time and did some shows afterwards. Uh, James Arness, of course, played uh, uh, Matt Dillon uh, on, the, uh, on the television. And uh -huh. so it, both those shows had a, a big following. And oddly enough, when you think of Perry Mason, the show that, which, uh, that revolved around uh, uh, the lawyer, uh, his show had a lot of lawyers listening to it. And if you read any biographies of, of uh, William Raymond Burr, they actually had him speak at American Bar Association conventions. He was one of the ideal uh, deal lawyers, I guess. Right, right, right. What were the favorite uh, children's shows at that time? Most popular children's shows? Oh, Make Believe, um, Big John and Sparky, as I talked about, uh, was, was a very favorite show of the kids. Uh, one of the local shows here was Crusader Rabbit. That was a big show. Uh, oh, okay. Uh -huh. and, not, and the old Russ Coglin used to be on uh, KGO uh, radio and television. 
uh, played the voice of the villain uh, on the Crusader Rabbit. And he said he got $5 an episode uh, for doing that. So those were uh, the really uh, kid shows that uh, I remember. And then, of course, the Westerns attracted. Right, right, kids. of course. Yeah. Sure. yeah. That was exactly. big, uh, and then, you know, the Westerns had big runs on uh, television as well. I was I read a book when I was in college called The Negro Cowboy. There were 5000 black cowboys who roamed the West uh -huh, and yeah. uh, you didn't see many of them uh, on, on the television. And oddly enough, um, there was a rumor that the real Lone Ranger was actually a black man. And huh. there, there was someone who was a legendary sheriff in those days, but it's it's highly doubtful that the people who originated that show would have based him after it. But uh, you can look that up uh, mm -hmm. and see uh, under what was the Lone Ranger actually black and it will uh, will bring up the, the fellow's name at all. Yeah. Now that segues into my next question. Were sure. these shows specifically geared to ethnic groups? Any type of radio shows geared to ethnic well, well, sadly, the one that was the most popular that we don't run today was uh, Amos and Andy. Amos and oh, okay. Eddie was such a popular show that mm -hmm. even when people went to the movies, they would delay the movies for 15 minutes to listen to Amos and Andy. Now, the, the Amos and Andy starred a lot of old, old black vaudevillian actors yeah. and had a variety of people. You had judges, you had lawyers, you had cab drivers, uh, you had scam artists. But the, the problem is that was the only way in which you could view black people. If you had a variety of shows, it might have just uh, been one of the other shows, but because it was the only show and people acted in dial, you know, spoke in dialect, uh, et cetera, it became unpopular. But, and the other thing was the two, uh, two white guys uh, on mm -hmm. the radio portrayed Amos and Andy. And it wasn't until you got to the television that you had black actors actually portraying. Uh, but I don't really know of any serious program in those days that mm -hmm. that was portrayed by black folks. Even like the Charlie Chan shows were, were white people affecting a so-called Chinese uh, accent uh, as the, the white folks so, you know, uh, uh, affecting a Southern or a so-called black dialect uh, on, the, right. uh, on the radio. Uh, and of course they, they, they couldn't do that on the, with the black faced on, uh, on television. So oh, that yeah, didn't that work. Right, sorry. we right. have a question though. We have, do have a question. Okay. Um, the question is, what are the book, best books to read or have as a reference guide? Well, there are two that, that uh, I use, one for radio and one for television. And that's okay. after culling through a lot. It's, this one is called Tune In Yesterday, the ultimate encyclopedia of old time radio. 1925 to 1976 and okay. it has the plots and the stars of all of the shows uh from that era uh even the the breakfast show don mcneil's breakfast show we used to play that every morning we'd walk we'd march around the breakfast table when i was a kid that was a that was very popular and so that's kind of the authority on that and the one that i used when i was on the radio was total television now the book would have to be an encyclopedia with all the shows that are on television and this was a comprehensive guide to programming from 1948 to what was then called the present and that was by alex mcneil and those are the two programs if you're into nostalgia and going back to find out what was on back in the day what was on at the time what times they were on what stations they moved to um, like I'm turning, I'm an opening it right now to Mr. Keen, Tracers of Lo Tracer of Lost Persons, first heard on NBC, uh, October 12th, 1937, as a three times a week, 15 minute serial for Bicidol. Mr. Keen might legitimately be called Mr. Chameleon's grandfather. There was another wonderful show that was a quiz show that was called Information Please, which was on the air from 1938 to 1948. And they'd have four experts uh, and you would get so much money if your question was chosen. Uh, if your question stumped the experts, you'd get more money. And then as the show went on and the budget became greater, you get a, 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 an entire set of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, and then uh, the show was very big in uh, war bond, the war bond efforts. And they would sometimes go to different uh, cities to produce the show. But uh, Oscar Levant was one of the regulars, uh, John Karen, and uh, they had uh, one other one, uh, his name escapes me right now, but that was a great show. Interesting, yeah. 
Could you talk about the radio commercials? They were just more, they're just more important than the shows themselves, right? The commercials. Oh, right. J E L L O was one of the commercials. And uh, uh, George Burns and Gracie Allen was Carnation Milk, you'd remember. And then the theme song, da 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 da. Uh, yeah, those were, and, and then in those days, they would slip the uh, uh, commercial into the body of the program, like Johnson's oh. Wax. Uh, would be slipped into the program at some point. We must do a better job of paper salvage than we have ever done before. With so much paper going to our armed forces overseas, we must save for salvage every bit of every kind of waste paper that remains in this country. Remember, paper packs a punch. So get in touch with your local salvage committee today, won't you? So you would, it was, it was kind of an integrated sort of uh, thing rather than, you know, we're taking time to hear from our sponsors, such and such and so and so, which made it a little bit more interesting uh, and also kept you listening a little bit better. I was talking to somebody the other day that the old jingles are, are the, the theme songs from the shows uh, are, are pretty much gone, but you'd hear some, some music in the background for some of the shows, but the George Burson, and Gracie Allen, that one kind of stood mind. Also, people don't realize Gracie was a San Franciscan. Uh, she went to Star of the Sea School uh, out in the Richmond I didn't district. I know that. And her brother was an accountant for Standard Oil. And they worked him into the program. And he was getting mail. And he didn't like it. He was a very quiet, reclusive kind of guy. He said, Gracie, that's your business. It's not mine. So I'd appreciate it if you'd leave me out of the shows. And, uh, and they, when they first started off... Uh, she was the straight woman and then George was the uh, was the funny guy and then they flipped it. Uh, she was kind of the crazy wacky one and then George was uh, the one who would step out and, and every now and then you know uh, talk to the audience directly and then go back into uh, into form uh, and always had that cigar. And of course he was he <laughs> and uh, Bob Hope lived to be a hundred years old and they planned it to be that way. Uh, George Burns had a great sense of humor. They said, George, why don't you date women your, your own age? He says, there are no women my age. <laughs> <laughs> said, what do you talk about with the women you date? He says, they're homework. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the word soap opera, does that derive from the soap commercials? Yes, it does. Uh, they had a lot of does uh, and, and various Tide and various other uh, f commercials that actually sponsored the show. And they would go from day to day and sometimes once a week, but they were usually, you know, maybe 15 minute segments. And then they went to half an hour segments. And you can picture mothers ironing and listening to the programs. Uh -huh. Uh, Cole Porter used to love Stella Dallas. Whatever he was doing, he would stop what he was doing and listen to Stella Dallas. And it was almost as if these people became part of their families. Uh, right. and, give, uh, and, you know, they, they moved over to, to television. You had the Guiding Light and some of the other shows that lasted. Uh, I think they're still on now. They've kind of adapted to the, uh, to the times. But the, interesting, the interesting thing was is that humor changes over time and plot lines change. And sometimes the stars of the show actually died and then you had to bring somebody else on. How could you right. do that seamlessly? Or, or they ran out of plot lines. I once interviewed Lauren Green, who was big on Bonanza. And he told me, he said, no, oh, wow. they're, all, they're only 17 plots extant. That's it. And they all derive from Shakespeare. That was his theory. <laughs> wow. I think we have another question. Hold on sure. here. Uh, yeah. The question. Uh, do you recall the cinnamon bear? The cinnamon bear? Cinnamon Bear. Yeah. Was, was that on syndicated? Uh, let me see if I can look that up and see if I can yeah. find, find that for you. Uh, I don't remember that. Uh, yes. Sometimes these shows went to uh, China J. Were just local shows. And if they were national, it will be in the, hey, I've got it right here. Let's we see have what it? we can do. Okay. The Cinnamon Bear was a Christmas story syndicated to stations around the country in 26 chapters, usually beginning just before Thanksgiving and ending just before Christmas. First heard in 1937, the show was repeated yearly and markets because of its universal appeal to children. The Cinnamon Bear uh, took them to a world of fantasy where giants, pirates, dragons, and witches lived. It began in the home of Judy and Jimmy Barton, two normal, healthy kids anxiously awaiting Christmas, when their mother sends them into the attic for the silver star traditional ornament at the top of the tree, the adventure begins. There they meet Patty O'Cinnamon, a stuffed bear come to life. 
the cinnamon bear tells them that the star has been stolen by the crazy quilt dragon who has escaped with it to maybe uh, maybe land if the kids ever if the kids are ever to see the silver star again they must follow the dragon the cinnamon bear teaches them to degrow that's d e g r o w and they shrink to the height of 4 inches off they go into a crack in the wall into the world of make believe the quest takes them through the land of ink blotter soldiers across the root beer ocean and into confrontations with such characters as the Wintergreen Witch, Fofo the Giant, and Captain Taffy the Pirate. The show is written by Glenn Heisch and is directed by Lindsay McHarris with music by Felix Mills. Songs were by the Paul Taylor Quartet. The entire serial was unearthed by Terry Black, an Illinois collector, with the help of Frank Nelson. He came up with most of the names of the cast members. And they go through the names of the cast members there, but it was on the air and I never heard of it before. And I'm happy that we were able to bring it to the attention of the questioner. And it's on page 132 of the book, Tune In Yesterday, just to make sure that it's still available. I went online yesterday and you can get it from amazon.com. Again, the name of the book is Tune In Yesterday, The Ultimate Encyclopedia of Old Time Radio, 1925-1926 by John Dunning. Noah, could you hold the book up? Could you hold sure. it up? Sure. Let me see if I can do that right now. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Great. Mine, perfect. mine is a little bit worn. and I <laughs> cracked it in two, so I had to order a new hardback yesterday. <clears throat> right. I, I have a question, another question. Um, sure. What was the percentage of radio listening audience? The percentage? Did everyone have a radio back then? And everyone pretty to- much once they came down in price, they were fairly expensive mm-hmm. initially. And when they came down in price, I was talking to a fellow the other day about the early radio, the transistor radios of our day. And in uh, 1957, 58, they were patterned after Sputnik and they looked like a little space ray and they had an antenna, which came up and they had all, uh, alligator clips, which wow. you clipped to the, um, to something like a fence to ground it. And the thing I remember most was uh, about a, a transistor radio. I, can't, I think it was 1959, Willie McCovey came up to bat to play for the Giants for the first time. And my friend Ken Matsuoka had a transistor radio, which we had tethered to the cyclone fence. And he went one for one. We were playing strikeout against the wall. And then we went two for two. And then because he was a rookie and we were young, we would identify him with him three for three, and he went four for four that day. We cut out the box score the next day. It said McCovey batting 1,000. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the, that was before the uh, Giants were broadcast. The first Giants broadcast was 1962 on television. So you would listen to them. And there was Russ Hodges and Lon Simmons. And I met Lon Simmons <laughs> once, and I said, is it true that you started off as a... Uh, Baseball player got injured, then became a carpenter. And then when you got the job with the Giants, you walked midway across the Golden Gate Bridge and you took your carpenter's belt and you flung it. He said, no, it's not a true story, but it's good enough for you to tell. So keep telling it, kid. (laughs) (laughs) I was on the radio at KYA from seven to 10 on Sunday mornings. And he said, I said, I do a little talk show. He said, when are you on? I said, seven to 10 on Sunday mornings. He says, I'll call you up next Sunday morning and tell you how good I am. <laughs> <laughs> I, I sang, uh, I sang for uh, uh, the, uh, the birthday party of their first manager at Moose's uh, back in, uh, oh gosh, when he retired. And uh, Russ has a great sense of humor. He said, Noah Griffin sang the national anthem because he forgot the words to Melancholy Baby. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, talking about people being on radio that can last for a long time, uh, the announcer for the uh, for the Dodgers, who uh-huh. just retired a couple of years ago, Vince Scully, his first year in radio was Jackie Robinson's last year with the Dodgers. And he just oh, wow. retired two years ago. So voices in radio became come like old friends and and you can stay on forever. And, and television, you might get a little bit old and they cashier you out the door, but radio uh you can stay for a long time lon seven had a wonderful voice it was just so refreshing and uh reassuring that somebody from your past was still there you know right i have another question um 
is podcast similar to old fashioned radio broadcasting podcast yeah. today? Is it kind of similar or is it, how would you characterize that, compare that? In a way, because it, it keeps, uh, keeps the listener engaged. Uh, you, you don't have to be fully uh, engaged in, in terms of your mind being engaged. You don't have to be fully, you know, you can play it in the car. You can, uh, you can be doing other things. Television, you almost have to be right there watching what's going on. Right. Uh, right. So exactly. I think podcasts sort of keep it alive. And also, you know, people thought radio was going to go out when television came in. But I think, you know, radios in the car are, are, are really something that people and there's still people like like uh, KQED on the weekends. Uh, wait, mm-hmm. wait, don't tell me, which is a wonderful quiz program. Mm-hmm. People they tune into that at 11 o'clock and and sometimes they stay for the rest of the day because there's so many wonderful, wonderful radio shows on. Yeah. Right. Um, another question. Were there any social political messages in programming? Social political messages, these radio, these programs that they aired? Uh, not really. There was Voice of America, which was uh-huh. aimed uh, overseas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they would do bond drives during the war. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, the FBI, you know, and the sense is sort of political programs, but it's elevating. Yeah. Uh, right so-called good guys or, or gang busters, you know, elevating the police or dragnet, you know, which went uh, from radio to television, uh, right, those, right. those kinds of shows. So the message was subtle or I spy for the FBI. Um, mm-hmm. Those were programs that kind of elevated uh, MacArthur, uh, MacArthur and what they were doing. Uh, in, in a, so in a way, those were political programs that, that had a message. So I, I, you have to say that the, the message programs and message shows. Uh, right, right. Yeah, I think we have another question here. Hold on. Um, sure. Yeah, perfect. Uh, do you remember Ira Blue? Do I remember Ira Blue? <laughs> yes, I remember Ira Blue because- It was a uh, radio show. So the San, San Francisco was- radio show, and yeah, he yeah. broadcasted from the other room at the Hungry Eye. Uh, when I was 16 years old, uh, I, I uh, auditioned to sing at the Hungry Eye. And uh-huh. Ira Blue, whose daughter, I believe, uh, was a teacher at Washington High, uh, I was actually on his program. And he touted the fact that I was at Washington High. And uh, uh, he was quite something. He was one of the earliest uh, talk show hosts who I remember very, very fondly. Yes, Ira Blue. I mean, probably not going to find him on the in the tune in yesterday radio book because he uh, it was not a nationally syndicated show. Oh, I see. Very, very popular here. Uh, And uh, Al Collins uh, had a show, too, uh, on uh, and he I think he went from radio to radio, then to television. He was on uh, KSFO, not in the old old days, but certainly in the 50s when KSFO was located in the Fairmont Hotel. Mm hmm. And uh, Al came out here from New York, I think in 1957, when KSFO was, it, it built itself as the world's greatest radio station. And uh, indeed, many think it was with the, with the wonderful uh, music that they played back in the day. Uh, Jim Lang was on the show and uh, 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 they had a, like a 15 share of the ratings. Uh, they were a very, very popular show. When did they start? I think... KSFO, there was one sh- one program, one program. I think KCBS began under different call letters in 1913 in San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, KSFO uh, switched call letters. I think it might have been KTAB first over in Oakland, then coming to San Francisco. Of course, its its mainstay was Don Sherwood, who was okay. on in the morning, who everybody listened to. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, he was just uh, had a fantastic listenership. Uh, a lot of folks got their start on that program. Jim Lang told me they had, uh, there were only 10 stations on the radio dial. And get this, they carried both the San Francisco Giants and the San Francisco 49ers. They had front row seats to all the acts that came to the Venetian room. And when I worked for KGO, we were so popular at the time that when a celebrity came to town, 
if they didn't come on our radio show first and they went on television, we wouldn't have them on. They had to be on KGO radio first before they went anyplace else. Right, right, right. I think we have another question here. Hold on. Um, yeah. Um, can you talk about Candy Matson? Candy Matson? Candy Matson. <laughs> which is orig originated in San Francisco, actually. Oh, yes, it yeah. did. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And I've got to look Thank that you. up. Those are one of the few women that actually starred in a radio drama. And ah. uh, I found that here. Uh, one second, okay. Here we go. Can Candy Matson, undoubtedly one of the brightest, most unusual detective shows of the air, originated at KNBC San Francisco and wow. was first heard on Pacific Coast NBC stations, June 29th, 1949. It starred, Nat it starred Natalie Masters as the chic, beautiful girl, Candy, whose crisp voice meant business. She operated out of her San Francisco apartment, telephone Yukon 28209, and managed to scare up as many murders as most male gumshoes. The murder wow. element was always prevalent in Candy Matson, though character was developed to a degree not always found in series detectives. Candy was portrayed as an extremely feminine heroine, but without a trace of squeamishness. Somewhere along the line, she also dragged in her friend, Rembrandt Watson, played by Jack Thomas. Watson wasn't much of the down and dirty Department wasn't much in the down and dirty department, being something of a cream puff. So he usually handled record checking and other legwork. Candy's male idol was San Francisco policeman Ray Millard, well played by Henry Leff. Eloise Rowan played the organ music, and Dudley Manlow was an announcer. The show is written and produced by Natalie's husband, Monte Masters, and they were heard until May 21st, 1951. That was wow. the grand day when Millard finally popped the question. Candy didn't give him much of an instant answer, but Millard announced with grand authority that it would be his last case, and it was. Thank you for bringing that up. Wow. That's interesting how they switched the roles there in that show. So I, yeah. I would say she was pretty much of a standard bearer. Thank you for remembering Candy Matson. Candy Matson, M-A-T, Matson, Matson, Matson lines. Exactly. Where were some of the earliest uh, radio shows, some of the really early ones? Well, some of the early ones were actually uh, news programs. Uh, mm -hmm. so they, they, and they were programs that literally later on featured music. For instance, um, the, there was a radio show from uh, the Cotton Club between 1927 and 1931 that made Duke Ellington famous because oh, really? Duke Ellington became nationalized at that point. Uh, some of the other big bands of the time thought that they would wear out their welcome traveling around the country if people right. heard them on the radio, but Duke Ellington was smart enough to go on the radio. So he mm -hmm. was there from 1927 to 1931. That was the longest time he ever stayed in one place because the rest of the time he was on the air. I got a chance to audition and sing for him in 1970 when he took his sacred concert, which debuted in San Francisco at Grace Cathedral. Uh, he brought it to Boston and I was a soloist at the Harvard University Choir while I was going to law school. And I saw in the paper where he was looking for a singer and I thought, well, let me see if I can audition for him. His advance man gave me a copy of a 1925 unknown tune he had written called I'm afraid, which was totally appropriate because I was terrified. I was 22 years old. I sang the song, uh -huh. he got up and immediately left. I, I don't think I did well. So I, I really did well in the concert solos. And afterwards I went backstage. I said, I'm sorry, I wasted your time. He said, you didn't waste anybody's time, young man, but don't be afraid to tell anybody something's not in your key. Uh, that was a metaphor for life. And had I been I had enough poison stature. I said, Mr. Ellington, I, I, I do this in the key of such and such and so and so. I thought if Ellington played it in his key, I should sing it in the key, even if right. it wasn't mine. But uh, so that, that was one of the earlier shows. And it's interesting how uh, recordings got started because when recordings began by Edison, 
they weren't really thinking of making records out of them. They were thinking of uh, re- going around and recording very famous people. Um, uh-huh. So uh, I have a, a set of recordings of very early. There's, there's even John Greenleaf Whittier on one of them. Uh, and Tennyson is on one of them doing a verse from the Charge of the Light Brigade. Uh, so it's interesting how radio starts off. And then uh, the uh, the news programs didn't come along till much later, but, you know, in the, uh, if you go to the theater, you would uh-huh. see news reels and you would get right. two, uh, two cartoons, a news reel and two features. Uh, so things, things, things alternate and things change. Also listening to old time radio, you can see how tastes in humor, uh, the humor that was, would, might be considered corny, you uh, over, you'd shift over time until you get the kind of humor that was in the fifties and the sixties and uh, it's yeah, a little correct. different. Yeah. Right. What were your favorite radio shows? Well, k- k- kind of the ones that I, I mentioned. Uh, I, I love the Whistler. I loved as a child. I loved the Hopalong Cassidy it was big for me. Uh, the Lone Ranger was really big uh, for me. Um, I love Lights Out. Um, uh, the Groucho Mark show, which I still listen to avidly. And you can find uh, the, the uh, TV Groucho Mark show if you go on YouTube, but Groucho is just that. the best. And Jack Benny with his, I mean, he was so, his, his sense of humor was so wry. I thought that he was wonderful. Uh, so those were uh, a lot of the ones which I liked. Dragnet, of course, with Jack Webb, who started off as a radio guy in San Francisco on the old KGO when it was located where KBHK was for a while on Taylor Street. And I have a recording of him somewhere doing a stand-up of a beached whale out at Hunter's Point. And he had that same staccato delivery, which was just wonderful, which he uh, made very famous. And there's a clip between him and Johnny Carson on the show uh, talking about the clipto kleptomaniac or something like that. And we go on with a lot of alliterations with the Ks and that's worth going back. It's worth not seeing them crack up and able to do it flawlessly without missing a line. <laughs> <laughs> Will you be writing a book about old time radio programs? Oh, I think, I, I think that the, the, the field is probably preempted by everybody that's, that's done them. It, it, I have a few in me, but they'll probably uh, go back to, to my dad who was a, a, a civil rights pioneer. Uh, he lived a very fascinating life. Uh, if, if I have one in me, that, that would be good. But it's, it's, it's just fun to sort of reminisce. And if you get that, again, let me, let me give them a plug because there's no money yeah, involved please, here. Please. It's uh, 1710 Antioch, old time radio on the internet and 24 hours a day by genre and by date. You can get the programs early in the morning, uh, very early in the morning. They have quiz shows, they have detective shows, they have um, cowboy shows. At two o'clock in the afternoon, they have Lux Radio Theater. Uh, then they have mystery shows, detective shows, superheroes, you might, uh, Bud Collier, who was on uh, Beat the Clock, was actually played Superman, which never would have done because he was sort of a puny guy uh, on, on the television. And he started off playing Superman on the radio, uh, which is a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's if you like old time radio, and uh, just as it was with the commercials, as we talked about a little bit oh, the earlier, commercials, yeah, the commercials, the commercials yeah. you can find it uh, on the internet, 17th Antioch old time radio. They even have, if you go macandmind.com, uh, you can find what the lineup of the show will be. So you tune in uh, to see the, to listen to the kind of show that you want to listen to. That's fascinating. Very, very fascinating. Let me see if you have any more questions here. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah. Actually, we don't. Um, yeah, any, uh, any closing words you'd like to say or anything? Um, well, I just like to remember to remind people that radio still exists. It is the theater of the mind. Uh, it's fun. It's exciting. Uh, even as an adult who who maybe didn't grow up in that era, to go back and to listen to what was funny then. Mm-hmm what people were thinking about, what they were doing, what was important to them at the time, uh, and maybe contrast it with the humor of today. There's not a lot of insult humor. It's just kind of fun uh, and adventurous uh, and mysterious. So please avail yourself of it. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, Noah, I want to thank you so much. It was such amazing talk about old-time radio programs. I really learned a lot, have a deep appreciation for 
old time radio programs now, and I'll definitely listen to that station on any you know. <laughs> Thank I'm you, sure. Robert. It's a pleasure <laughs> having been with you. And I'm sure our viewing listeners really enjoyed your program too. I'm sure they're now very enriched about these old time shows, you know. And love to have you back again for another topic on old time radio. Absolutely, you got it. There, there, there are a lot of them to be talked about. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there is. I'm sure there is, though. Yeah, great. Well, thank you once again, Noah. Thank you. I'd like to thank our visiting, um, listening audience today for uh, chiming in on this show tonight. Um, I really appreciate that. Once again, my name is Robert Milton, and thank you for coming. And um, next time, we'll see you again. All right. I'm the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. More and more paper used in the manufacture of many vital war supplies must be shipped overseas. We must do a better job of paper salvage than we have ever done before. With so much paper going to our armed forces overseas, we must save for salvage every bit of every kind of waste paper that remains in this country. With the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty, Ohio Silver, the Lone Ranger.